The abduction of hundreds of schoolgirls in Nigeria raised global issues concerning the status of women. What are some of these issues? Find out on Talking with Henrietta, coming up next. Hi, I'm Henrietta. Welcome to the show. The capture and detention of nearly 300 schoolgirls in Nigeria last April by a group called Boko Haram inspired rallies throughout the world. The hashtag Bring Back Our Girls gained global attention, and it became a symbol of the need to educate girls, to end all forms of slavery, and to extend human rights to everyone. On this show, I'll talk with two of the organizers of the Bring Back Our Girls effort on the San Francisco Peninsula and in the South Bay. On my left is former California State Assembly member Sally Lieber. Lieber served in the California State Legislature from 2002 to 2008. During that time, she authored the California Tracking Victims Protection Act, which was the first state law to deal with human trafficking. Before serving in the legislature, she was on the Mountain View City Council, where she served as the city's mayor. On my right is Chike Wofia, an actor, theater director, educator, and an award-winning filmmaker. Wofia has been described as one of the top ten most influential African Americans in the San Francisco Bay Area. He is presently the executive director of the Oriki Theater, a Mountain View-based nonprofit performing arts company that provides workshops, performances, and outreach programs that share African arts and culture. In 2008, he received a certificate of special congressional recognition from the United States Congress. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much for joining me. Well, I mentioned the global attention that the abduction of the schoolgirls received around the world. Was that a surprise to you? Well, I think what was a, a surprise to me was that it was really the first time that the issues that have been going on in Nigeria for quite some time really surfaced in the American press. And I think it took two to three weeks after the issue was discussed in the international press for it to really start to penetrate the mainstream press in the U.S. Um, it's something that's way overdue. Um, we need to, uh, as a country, start focusing more on international affairs uh, than we ever have in the past. And Nigeria is one of those places that is a very um, populous, a very dynamic country, and deserves much more press attention than it's gotten. Um, there were several people in Congress who raised the issue of Boko Haram over the past few years, but there hasn't really been the discussion until there was the kidnapping of nearly 300 schoolgirls. And if any good thing can come out of this tragedy, uh, I think it will be surfacing these issues for the world to see. So, Chike, did the world attention given to the abduction surprise you? Um, yes and no. I, I think, uh, just like Sally said, uh, you know, oftentimes when one is in the United States, it does appear that the rest of the world is a mistake. Oh. You know? <laughs> and, um, you know, for some of us that, that we're not born here, we we'll get here and that reality hits you because of how ignorant um, people are about, you know, the continental Africa itself. And, you know, one gets asked some questions, you know, people's perception actually of Africa oftentimes here is, is, is so warped that you wonder um, what's going on in the, in, in the school systems where people think up till today that Africa is perhaps like a tiny village. Uh, yes, yeah, so it is the dark continent. Right, yeah. you know, that kind of perception. And so it, it feeds into these kinds of things where um, something is happening and, and people just don't 
cannot connect to it um, because it takes human connection. Uh, but on the other hand, I think thanks to social media, um, it shows that we are now in a world, particularly with a younger generation, that through social media, people are beginning to reach across this geographic di divide and, and, and connect on human basis. And so with a hashtag moving this movement forward, you found uh, people began to see and touch and feel um, this camaraderie. They, they began to understand the interconnectedness of our humanity. And I think it was the scale of this particular obscenity that happened, as well as the just carelessness and outright um, wickedness of the act itself and, and the, the, the scope of the tragedy, the victims. There were just so many, if you will, ironic, perfect assemblage of, of the storm that came together in this particular you know, incident that now bred this amazing global phenomenon. Sure, we have uh, three pictures and we probably, you probably won't be able to see them. But one was the graphic bring back our girls that was used to um, get people to come to the rally in East Palo Alto. So if we could see that graphic. And then we have several photos of uh, the assemblage, the rally in East Palo Alto. So I'm hoping we can bring those up while we can't see them in the studio. And at least now while we're talking about it, we could perhaps see several of those. And during the rally in East Palo Alto, for instance, it was said that this is an issue that should stay in the public attention, stay on the front pages. Well, it has not. It has not stayed on the front pages. And uh, even online, it's, it's, you have to search for it. Right. So its disappearance, did that surprise you? Well, it, it didn't s surprise me in one sense, but it's a source of great frustration. <laughs> and if you think back to the Iran hostage crisis, when it was U.S. hostages, uh, I think there was, you know, it's day 478 of the hostage crisis. What's going on was top of the news story. And it should really prick the conscience of all Americans um, most of whom would say that girls need our support worldwide, uh, that girls are precious to us, uh, to know that this isn't top of the news. Um, and I recently heard an, an interview on public radio um, where uh, the person who was being interviewed said the hashtag actually worked, but it ran out of steam. And I think that this is one of the things that we need to have more discussion of, particularly as American women. We have great influence that we don't use worldwide. We have great influence on American politics. American women make the decision for how their families vote. And both the major political parties know about that and cater uh, to women in that way with their themes. And they certainly will be doing so in the 2016 election. But the impact that it had, and the hashtag came from Nigeria um, and really spread worldwide, um, I, I think it's something that we really need to not underestimate. And this was what made the East Palo Alto rally very, very important. We need to be having rallies and teach-ins and discussions about these issues everywhere. And what we talked about there was, if, if it were our daughters, we would want a rally or a demonstration or a discussion to be happening in every city and every town. Well, I think Mrs. Obama really uh, added a lot when she held up a sign saying, bring back our girls. It's out of the public arena, at least not on the front pages. Is that a surprise? Is it expected? Or um, well, um, for someone like me who is also, um, who, who interfaces with the media in one way or another as a producer or a filmmaker, but I think I wasn't surprised that, um, that just like a lot of things, um, it looks like it was, I was praying, I was hoping, you know, just as Sally said, it was frustrating um, to, um, to see how quickly it dropped off the, 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 the front page. Um, which was sad, and that's something that needs to be addressed. Um, but I think it, it shows that um, unless 
people, it takes you and I, it takes everyone to stand up and say, uh, because every day that is lost, every day that goes by that this thing is not, you know, front page news, it is front page news for the for the parents. Is it front page news for the for the girls? Is front page news for those that are connected to the story? But um, we have to stop standing aside and waiting for somebody else to make to make this front page news. Yes, we do. At the same time, I think. There was more concern around the world for the situation than it seemed for the head of Nigeria, who seemed to have had to be pressured to pay attention himself and to take some government action. And well, that was somewhat disappointing. How would you explain that? Um, or well, would you come to the same conclusion? Well, I mean, from where I sat, from, you know, looking at what was going on, of course, a lot of us were frustrated with respect to the, you know, to the reactions of the Nigerian government itself. Um, um, and so, um, for whatever reason, um, we didn't feel, you know, just from my observations, and I, I don't, you know, work within the corridors of Nigerian politics, but um, one would have expected a much more definite, much more um, involved um, reaction or response to this to this tragedy that occurred in Nigeria. But that didn't seem to be forthcoming, and that was what all of us did observe. Now. Um, the reasons um, that has come out of the Nigerian government as to why they reacted in such a way, um, to some of us, we are just ludicrous. Um, you know, our daughters have just been ad abducted, and we believe, and I personally believe, that if that if that be the case, and one is the president of such a country, that everything else stops. Yes, but at the same time, this group that did the abduction has continued to ag abduct young women and I read recently after searching what has happened that 60 were abducted maybe a week or so ago and they escaped. So is this business as usual in various parts of the world? And so I was thinking maybe that's why there wasn't the attention given in Nigeria because this is, if not an everyday matter, this is something that continues to happen. Well, I, 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 don't, I don't know, I, and I, I, I'm not one who likes to speculate on what people are thinking or why they, they, what their motivations are. Um, the, the, the story is coming out of Nigeria at this moment in terms of the, the, the story about 60 mm -hmm. girls. It was actually supposed to be 60 of the original number that escaped, not a new set of 60 that were abducted and escaped. That was the story. However, there's also the story that Boko Haram continues um, yes. in, in the business of ab abducting girls and all of that. But it, it, it speaks to something that I think it's more, and, and again, one thing also that ought to be understood is um, that this is not about Nigeria in itself, and because oftentimes um, this conversation gets to the point where you you begin to wonder um, if if there are human beings even in Nigeria, except for those that have been abducted. You know, one out of every eight African is Nigerian by sheer numbers, and um, and so I still have family in Nigeria. Um, you know, my sister is a medical doctor. I have you know parents and all of that stuff, and so people are going about their lives. You know, and still concerned about what's going on in this remote part of the country, which is way up in the north. You know, actually at the border. Um, between Nigeria and Chad and all these other places, but it doesn't diminish the import of this. But what I'm trying to say that, you know, and I'm glad you, you, you know, you're linking this to the universal issue of the rights of women, what kind of um, society do we live in, and for how long are we going to continue on this journey that devalues women, um, and, and how these this continued practice of devaluing the woman uh, breeds situations that we've seen in different parts of the world, including right here in Palo Alto. You're absolutely and, and right. I, so I You're think that's, absolutely I think that is right. The, and that's why I love. That's what I love about the work that Sally is doing in terms of making these connections and making people understand that even as we sit here and talk about, you know, why and why not, that there are girls that are held in bondage 
within a mile or two from where we sit. You're absolutely and we know that right. for a fact. You're absolutely so right, and it might even be less than w within a mile. Right, yeah. <laughs> yes, so. that, and, and we don't know it, mm -hmm. or we claim not to know it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was while you were in the state legislature that you authored the Human Trafficking Act. Well, I don't think things have gotten any better, have they? Well, I, I don't know that they've gotten better, but the issue has has really been surfaced. There's sunshine on on the problem itself now and when Chike was referencing the north of Nigeria in uh, the isolation and the poverty that exists there we have to look at the US policymakers that allow vast tracts of the United States to be isolated areas of, of very concentrated poverty here as well and um, we know that the Bay Area is uh, a nexus for uh, human trafficking uh, due to our proximity to Asia and uh, to Mexico and Central America. Um, and it's been identified as one of the top seven areas uh, for child trafficking within the U.S. So it really is a worldwide problem, as Chike said, of the devaluation of women and children. And um, so it's it's something that we have to take on on a number of different fronts, culturally, telling the stories uh, through film, through art, through other media, through journalism, um, and just using the platforms that are out there that exist in the social media and the ability of uh, filmmakers to make a film at a small scale to be able to tell these stories to open people's eyes to what's going on. Now both of you have said devaluing. For example, Chike, you're the one who started it and you just repeated it. When I think of something that's devalued, I think of something that's had value, <laughs> that's devalued. Yes. And I would think in terms of the status of women worldwide, would it be fair to say that with some exceptions perhaps, there might not have been that historical value in the first place. Um, I come out of the, uh, and we had this conversation prior to getting on camera, I, I, I come out of the, the school of thought and the honest belief that every child of God has value. And I, it's not for me to put value on somebody, but one can try to devalue. That's why I use it, and I use it selectively and intentionally. Um, yes, we can talk about the plight of women all through history, all through societies. Um, in, you know, including the fact that it took till 1920 for women to have the right to vote in this country through the 19th Amendment. Even though we came out of Reconstruction, you know, in the 1870 with all the the whole, you know, Amendment 13, 14, and 15, it took another 50 years before women were even recognized to be able to get a franchise in this country. And up till today, as we speak in the United States of America, we talk about, you know, the world's greatest democracy. But you know, if, if, if Hillary Clinton or whomever decides to run for presidency, it's going to be news. And if they ever make it, it will be news. But look at the rest of the world, the women presidents, even on the African oh, continent. Oh, you're absolutely you right. Know, in so, Asia. Right. Yeah, in Gandhi. Right, I'm thinking, all of that. Yes. In, uh, you know, the in pres former president of Malawi, Joyce Banda, president of Liberia. So, I mean, on the African continent, women have become presidents, and yet in this country is still something. No, I'm, I'm just kind of wondering, is yeah. that something of an aberration? The fact that in a country like India, you had Indira Gandhi, um, oh, maybe 30 years ago, but then at the same time, women um, have a very low status in India. You know, so it, their election yeah. does not necessarily no, it's, it's, it's reflect not, no, it's, how it, women are held. No, you see, it, it, there's, there's an interesting thing, there's an interesting perception here that, that when we talk about some of these countries, there's a sense of holier than thou mentality that comes to play, especially when Americans are looking at every other country on the face of the planet. And I think that needs to be addressed. The reason is because I think to some extent that is what is creating and perpetuating the devaluing of women in the United States. Okay. It's a sense, hang on a second, it's a sense that gives, you know, even the women advocates a sense that, oh, but we have rights they don't have. People have to wake up to the fact that 
for the fact that women do not make equal sense on the dollar in this country is a problem. For the fact, you know, that women are still discriminated against in this country is a problem. But when, when the conversation ever comes up, the first thing people, what I call, is a distraction. First thing people think about is, oh, let's talk about what goes on elsewhere, mm -hmm. and therefore give the women a sense that, you know, your life is better, so to speak. Well, I was talking about elsewhere because these countries have had women leaders. Right. Whereas this country, other than on a local level, maybe a national level, like mm -hmm. Sally, right. <laughs> mm -hmm. lags behind in terms of having the head of the, the country as a woman. Right. But Chi said uh -huh. something very interesting, holier than thou. Do you think Americans are kind of holier than thou when it comes to talking about the status I, of women? I, I think definitely. <laughs> and, um, you know, there there is a sense in which uh, American women are, are privileged over women from many different countries where we don't have uh, the security that women have in some northern European countries where um, families are not as on the edge as they are in the United States. But the fact is that we have lost ground in the United States. If we look at um, from when the Supreme Court first supported Roe v. Wade and the ground that has been lost and women having the ultimate and, and most fundamental kind of sovereignty, sovereignty over their own bodies, has really been lost in, in a large measure um, in many states in the U.S. And we have to look at uh, the state where the women have least protection as, as being uh, what we use as, as the standard, not the states that we have the most protection, like California. Um, what are the states where they have the least? I could think of southern states, perhaps. Like I, I think Michigan, or? Ohio, um, some of the southern states. Uh, but there have been huge takeaways in terms of uh, women's right to control their own reproductive destiny and their own health care decisions. Um, and also, just in terms of societal support for women and families, in the 1980s, the, the supports that were there were characterized as welfare and taken away. So women that are trying to escape domestic violence don't have the societal supports that they once had um, before the late 80s. Um, we've also seen in, in large parts of the U.S. work go away completely and concentrated poverty grow in a way that hasn't existed since the early 1900s. Let's go back a moment. You said that they've lost some of the protections they had before the 1980s. As I remember, it was maybe during the 1980s up till now that, at least in California, there was more concern about women and domestic violence. I Prior that, to that, I think lawmakers and others just kind of look the other way. That's true. Um, we've given language now to domestic violence, to human trafficking, um, to various issues that impact women. But in terms of uh, the support financially for a woman who's on her own, who's on the edge, for families that are uh, on the edge financially, there is, is far less support now societally. And certain economic trends have just exacerbated that. Um, uh, what went on with the mortgage crisis was a, a fact of uh, policy infrastructure being intentionally taken away in the late 80s and allowing uh, a mortgage crisis of that kind to, uh, to occur to families. So a lot of the societal supports that were there have gone away. And because we don't have enough women in public office to, to mind the store, I, I think we're really suffering in terms of our policy infrastructure and protections for women. Now, that's interesting. I would almost think that might have been a biased conclusion. We don't have enough women to mind the store. Assumes <laughs> that if, if women are in power, things would be different. <laughs> well, do you think? I think, I think, I obviously think things would be different on the list. But I also don't want to lose track of the fact that, um, and, and when I talk about the, the holier than thou, you know, language here, I, I'm not, I, and I, I just want to be clear that that does not to, that doesn't presuppose that um, 
that, are, that these countries that we're talking about, for instance, India or some of the sub-Saharan African countries, that do not have you know, their challenges. I mean, they do have immense challenges. But what I'm trying to say is this, that there is a universality of concerns. And, and we must recognize that. We must recognize that um, you know, to not take care of the business at home and pretend that it doesn't exist, and, and so we should focus somewhere else, it makes it difficult, therefore, for the movement here in the United States to, to build and be strong enough because there's a sense, therefore, that, oh, there, you have all these rights over here. But I'm, I'm, what I want us to understand is that while we call attention to the challenges elsewhere, we must call attention to the challenges that are in this country. And when we talk about even sex trafficking in this country, it's not only about girls coming from overseas. It's about people from the Central Valley being brought to the Bay Area or from one part of the United States to another part of the United States. And these, a lot of these girls are American citizens. You know, so it's important that we understand that in our own backyards, in our own neighborhoods, that it's all is not well. Well, do you know, I uh, think there is a lot of support for this idea of holier than thou. Because if American, Americans did not think of this country as the best in the world or the ultimate in democracy, it might be easier to see the type of problems that you're talking about. It might be easier, you know, to look at the moat in our own eyes rather than going out there looking at what's wrong with the rest of the world. Well, I, I think back to when we introduced the California Trafficking Victims Protection Act, and at that time, so few people that were in the legislature had heard of human trafficking and, and really thought about it and identified it as something that is happening both in terms of of sexual abuse and forced labor, um, that there were a lot of people who voted no on making human trafficking a crime. And uh, the attitude for a number of members of the legislature was if people come here illegally, uh, they get what they deserve, was the, was the sentiment that was voiced. We know that that's a very uh, wrong-headed view, but it's a view that we're seeing really flourish with the child refugee crisis at our borders. And it hasn't um, gotten to the point yet where we're seeing the interconnections between very low income uh, women within the U.S. and what can happen in our own communities. Uh, the possibility and the impact of trafficking on what's happening with the child refugee crisis at our borders. Um, and starting to see uh, the situation of women and children as being the thread that runs through many, many different uh, issues. And I personally think that we tend to look at uh, places like African countries and think, oh, African problems. <laughs> we don't look at the lessons that we could learn and the approaches that have been successful there that could be applied to our local communities here. Well, before asking you, let me ask Chike the yeah. lessons learned. Now, I know you can't read her mind, but <laughs> <laughs> or can you? What are some of the lessons learned? Well, I, well I, I, is it fair maybe to go back to her? No, it's all right. I, I think um, first and foremost, with, with what has just happened with, with the Boko Haram situation, and Sally started by talking about the fact, which is true, that the Boko Haram situation has always been there. It's been there, you know, a year, it was there a year, it was there two years prior to the abduction of these girls. And one of the important lessons is if you let these kinds of things fester, if you don't challenge the so-called status quo, if people do not speak up, you know, uh, then it gets to these kinds of situations because you are basically acquiescing to, to these kinds of, you know, thugs or terrorist groups or whatever because no one no one is standing up. And so if we don't challenge the status quo, if we don't call attention to what's going on in our own neighborhoods, then all of a sudden we start bringing in the body bags and then that's when people start screaming. But before you get to that point, in my opinion, the lesson learned right there is to say, look at what happened. 
this thing has always been there. Nobody drew attention to it. Nobody stood up to it. Or maybe not enough, not nobody. There are always people. There are always warriors fighting the fight, the good fight. But maybe not enough people. We didn't mobilize enough. We didn't call attention to it. So we couldn't stop it. If we don't do that in our own neighborhoods, we are going to end up, you know, if not in situ the same situation, but something similar, something more tragic than we're seeing today. So I think that's an important lesson. Let me go back to you, Sally, in terms of lessons learned. What did you have in mind? I, I agree uh, absolutely with Chike's thought about a, a proactive approach. Um, I think that the U.S. has an awful lot of baggage <laughs> in many different countries and many different continents to, uh, to unpack and to try to uh, reverse engineer, to borrow a, a term from high tech. Uh, and we do have to go back and, and sort of look in a, a very clear-eyed way at how our traditional strategy has worked. Our traditional strategy is go into a situation, find the strong man in the situation who has the most guns, and give them more guns. Um, that hasn't worked well for us. We need to go in and take a page out of uh, the book of the Grameen Bank and other kinds of efforts and go in with a, a human development um, kinds of approach and empower women to be able to support their families, um, empower local communities to be able to solve the problems that they identify, the issues that they want to work on. Do you think that would be something that would be welcomed? I'm, I'm thinking, given the baggage that the U.S. has, it would be problematic for this country to try to go into some other countries telling them this is what you should be doing. No, but I think more, what Sally is saying, really, honestly, I agree with, with what she's saying because I think it's important. But what she's saying is not so much going to tell other people what they, what they should be doing. It's going in and realizing that development is a partnership journey. And if you come to any village, or any constituents, any community across the world, if you come with clean hands, as my people say, you eat good food. And so if you come in with an open heart, if you come in to say, let's, we are partners in this, this world belongs to both of us. It's not, we're not saying, here is a water pump. You know, you're coming in to have a conversation and then help and be partners in the journey to growth and development and sustainable development. So that these, you know, it's not about coming there and dropping, you know, like the old cliche of teaching somebody how to fish. The person gets fed for life as opposed to going to drop food aid, which is fish, and then they eat and then they're tied to you because they come back the next day for more fish. So what she's saying is a much more, um, I would say, progressive process, a much more dynamic way of, you know, and a long-term solution to some yes, of this. Yes, it things. is. So it will work. Yes, definitely. yes, it would if there was a sincere interest in attacking the problem. Yeah, that's but right. But <laughs> usually the interest is that America does what she feels is in her own self-interest in terms of American dominance or protecting American power. It's not necessarily about helping other people. But it's happening, though. I also want to say that, you know, what we are talking about, um, I, I like to celebrate the small victories, if you call them that, and the happy stories. And I think it's important that whether, um, even if the United States government, whatever <clears throat> that's supposed to represent, doesn't act in these ways that you're suggesting, there are good Americans, there are individuals that are already doing the work. For that, example? That are all over. I mean, I can't even name all of them. There's One World Children's Fund. There's ah. the Global Fund for Women. There is, I mean, there is just you can go on and on and on about there's the African Diaspora Network. There are so many organizations and individuals that are all over the villages of Africa, India, Guatemala, Venezuela. I mean, name it. Working, working with local communities. Some of them stay there for months and months without pay, helping local communities um, organize themselves, working with women and children. So it's, it, this is not, it's not something, it's not rocket science, it's already happening. But I think you know, the beauty of what Sally is saying is we need to recognize that and figure out how to scale it and how to make sure that people hear about these stories.